community and, um, and the public who are here today. Nice to see you uh, for the last council meeting of the year and some of us have been wandering around since 9.30 waiting for the council meeting. Um, but welcome, everybody's here, which was really nice on our last meeting. And welcome to the public who are looking in and um, wish you all a, well, a, a peaceful Christmas with your family. And I would ask Tanya, uh, Councillor Tapsell, if she'll open our meeting, please, with a karakia. <coughs> Ete atua, kaharoa, ko koe te tohu rangatira, he tohu matauranga. Manaki tia mai matau, au pononga i tēnei rā. E mahi nei i a matau mahi, mō te painga o ngā tangata o te kaunihera o Rotorua. Taku a mai, kia tai te rangi marie, ki runga i a matau i ngā wā katoa, ko i hukarati hoki to matau ariki. Almighty God, who alone is the leader of all mankind, and the fountain of all knowledge, send thy blessing upon us, your servants, this day, as we strive to do all things good for the betterment of the people of the Rotorua district. May we be tolerant in ourselves at all times. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And, and uh, before we go any further, um, you might be wondering what this is here. And I, I ask Monty, would you like to speak to this, please? Uh, kia ora, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, the trophy is the Te Reo Māori Award awarded to Te Amorangi Kimua. Of course, they are the staff who are active in promoting Te Reo Māori and our bicultural Reo Māori programme recognised by Te Tauta Whiri at their National Māori Awards about uh, two weeks ago. And we won the government section against, I think, uh, the Conservation Department and one other department. They were the, were the finalists. Kia ora. And I did get feedback, not personally, indirectly, uh, that it was due to the depth of the reo in the organisation, and I think that's outstanding. So, Jeff, if you pass that on, our congratulations on to the staff. We were very proud uh, to hear of that. It's just growing and growing. So now I'll call for any apologies, and there are none. So we'll move on. From that, are there any declarations of interest? There are none. Are there any urgent items yeah, on the agenda? Yes, Your Worship. Councillor Kent. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, in view of uh, recent events, uh, I would appreciate if we could put aside a little bit of time today just to uh, have a discussion and be updated on the joint um, initiative with the police over what's been happening in the CBD and perhaps uh, explore if there is anything else Council needs to do. Well, thank you, and We were all made aware of it, but many of us were well engaged uh, with the police a bit earlier. Do you want to speak now? It's not an urgent item, but it does need a... Um, yes, <coughs> Councillor. I mean, Jeff, please. Uh, um, so, so we've been working now with the police for more than a fortnight. They raised this issue with us on the basis of a national survey that had actually been undertaken looking at perceptions of safety and they were concerned as to uh, the, level of, the level of concern that exists around safety in our CBD. Um, based on those discussions there's to date a plan put into place that has got three main areas of action. Uh, the first that has actually been in place now for uh, just over a week where our cameras have been monitored now through into the evening on Saturday nights and now Friday nights. As of next week I believe that they'll also be monitored through on a Thursday night as well. Um, that runs through to approximately four o'clock in the morning. Um, based on that work which is coordinated with the police there's been a number of incidents which have resulted in arrests being made in the inner city as to inappropriate behaviour um, so that's the that's the first area the second um, is is an initiative uh, 
with us, which is again being coordinated with or alongside the police, of actually increasing a security presence in the inner city. That's got the effect that there will be two teams of two security staff in the inner city at any one time, and again that will actually go through into the early hours of the morning. Uh, the police during the daytime and in the evening as well are also joining those teams. Um, so what you're likely to see um, on the street is a security personnel walking alongside a, a police officer. Um, so that's going to give a, a much higher profile to, um, if you like, the sort of the the level of concern and also I think ease some of the concerns around safety in and, in and of itself. Uh, that, as I say, is being coordinated by the police. Um, so what they're looking to do is to try and work alongside the security team in a way whereby if um, they are called away to a particular incident but have got concerns about um, an event that may be, being de may be de under development in the inner city, they will task the security team to give a watching brief to, to the issue in the inner city while they respond potentially elsewhere and then uh, will rejoin the security team to, to address whatever issues that, that, that are actually sitting there. Um, so that's, that's, if you like, the, the main one. Um, in addition to that, we're currently looking <coughs> and excuse me, while it may not go directly to the issue of safety, looking at some activation work also. Um, so I'm basically looking at uh, sort of trying to increase the level of presence of people in the inner city, which in itself is an important outcome in terms of creating a broader sense of other people actually present. So that's where we are so far. Our intent is um, clearly this is an area that we hadn't planned to budget to the level that we currently are. Uh, so our intent is to evaluate this early in the new year and report back to O&M as to its, both its effectiveness and any implications as to ongoing cost. Thank you. Uh, just a supplementary. Uh, does the Chief Executive consider that um, we should be looking at any further regulatory assistance to help that in, uh, objective? <clears throat> so one of our we have also got a staff member that's just collated all of the bylaws that are in place across the country from various councils. That is actually being evaluated as to whether or not a paper will be presented to council again early in the new year. I just wondered whilst we're talking about this, you've got to look at this holistically. I just wondered whether we are reminding licensed premises and licensee holders and reminding them of their obligations in terms of liquor licensing and the Liquor Licensing Act. Um, because I, anecdotally, I, I don't know the truth of it, anecdotally I have heard that there have been some issues involving licensed premises that have, have contributed to some issues within the CBD and I just wondered whether staff, if this is true and have staff been alerted to it. And are there obligations? Outside of the public safety gambit, but do you want to answer that? Well, <coughs> excuse me. Well, firstly, I think um, last, last weekend the members of the Liquor Licensing Committee were present jointly with council staff alongside the police and visiting mm -hmm. licensed premises over the, over the weekend. Um, so that was specifically to look at actually the conduct of, of licensed licensed premises and, and in fact the, any, any issues that were arising from them. Um, the police are very also aware of this and when I referred to the security teams working through into the early, early morning, um, that is around the closure of licensed premises um, to ensure safety once, once those premises are closed. Councillor Rokoatate. Thank you, Madam Chair. Actually, I appreciate Councillor Kent raising this, and I mean, we've all had communications and seen the newspaper today, but there's two distinct areas here. One is the harassment of people going about their business uh, during the day and enjoying our inner city, and the other, is, of course, is the evening antisocial behaviour by people who are either liquored up or intend to get liquored up. So they're quite distinctive, and actually the strategies for both are quite different. 
and it is about identity. I mean, quite frankly, I've seen the communique from the police. Uh, this has been going on for such a long time, and um, I'm amazed that something hasn't happened in the inner city, but it's been going on for a long time. People are really angry about it, and it's not just Reg Hennessy. There are other people as well, and I suspect that what I've heard so far will not counter the problem sufficiently to, um, to have any long-term effects. So it does require good monitoring, and um, I think we've come at it far too late in the day. Well, so. I'll, I'll speak to that because... And another um, thing, or can I just say also, yeah. um, it makes us look a little bit foolish when we don't know, because I responded to the email and I didn't realise there was a plan already in place or had been developed. So I think that's something that's a bit more sharing of communication so that we don't look at Charlie. Thank you. Well, I'll speak to that because I think that's a very valid point. This began, um, it began a long time ago actually. We've always had a summer preparedness plan. That's nothing new. We know that school kids are out and there's a, so there's a mix of cohorts that we're dealing with here. But we had it um, brought to our attention when I met the regional commander of police with Dave Donaldson, with Deputy Dave, brought it back and the CEO got going on working with the police on a joined up plan of action way back then, so some weeks ago. We wanted to share the plan with councillors first and as soon as the email was received then it got into social media before councillors had a chance to even hear about the plan. The plan wasn't even finished um, completely. We wanted councillors to know first so you wouldn't be caught like that. But the letter went viral and then the responses started making everybody jittery. The plan was well developed and you would have heard about it today as a part of a Christmas preparedness plan. So that's where it often gets a little bit out of sync um, and I think the value of us continuing to meet that at our last meeting we also had the regional commander of police there. This isn't a new issue in any town, um, in fact it's quite widespread, uh, but it is our, our concern and our concern for local safety and public safety and, um, and I, this is a very good start, I think it's about monitoring as you say councillor rokawatate um, and if you have we shouldn't discuss a plan here if you have other ideas uh, because they've come in too constructively from members of the public then if you could get them to the chief executive such as um, increased use of maori wardens so there's other ideas coming in now that they know that we have a joined up plan with the police if I, mm. if I can just add two more comments and, and this, these are items that are being worked on but not yet active. Um, the first is a communication strategy again particularly with inner city retailers in that one of the issues is that people fundamentally are not reporting incidents to the police. Um, that creates a, a problem in and of itself and that the police become not aware of actually some of the issues that are actually happening. Um, and that's not actually present in their statistics which they themselves look at in terms of the deployment of staff. So uh, the communication strategy is, is actually important. The second part is, is actually looking to work with um, the likes of the Ministry of Social Development as to what, how do we manage situations where uh, people, young people for example, are picked up in the inner city potentially um, in situations where they've been involved in crime, how, how should they actually be effectively managed once, once they're actually in custody? Um, so that's a, an action that's currently sitting with, with the police um, and we're supporting them with that, but that's looking at trying to say, can we actually get a much more interagency response to, to dealing with issues once, once they've occurred? In a previous life when I was chairman of finance and uh, planning committee, we used to meet quarterly with the police in confidential. Uh, I, there are several issues, not only CBD, but there are several issues swirling around in the community that I believe we should hear confidentially what the police strategy is or the management strategies of those particular issues are because at the moment um, you know, two major issues have occurred recently, one including uh, involving two deaths and one including 
a considerable seizure of um, contraband. And I just wondered whether, uh, along the lines of what Councillor Rokawa take, is forewarned as forearmed, so that we can, you know, in our context, the 12, 13 of us who are meeting our community on a regular basis and get asked these questions about where are they heading with this, this and this, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, we can share that. Publicly, we can't because it's confidential and I don't want to share those things publicly on, on social media, etc. But I, I think the value of the 13 of us meeting maybe six monthly or quarterly uh, with police, MSD, would, would arm us with the knowledge, would arm us with the knowledge of, of what's actually happening in terms of strategy so we aren't uh, you know, the afterthought. I, we'll take that on board. If you remember at the beginning of this triennial, we all agreed that we wouldn't clutter meetings with presentations. Mm. So we'll just consider it, and Una, if that is brought back in the new year, I think that would be a good point. Councillor Gould. Make a comment about this, because as a re past retail in the CBD of 36 years, when we had a community constable based in the city focus, it wasn't as noticeable. And when we had policemen patrolling the city, you know, during the during the year, again, this wasn't a noticeable. It, at some Christmases, we actually had armed police patrolling the city, you know, because th they were um, implying to the public that yes, we're looking after your safety. But in the last few years, the police presence in the city is. Um, Beat, uh, constables walking around the beat has just not been there. Well, we, we all know that, um, but I did hear the Chief Executive talk about the partnership with the police to put teams in that will be around the CBD. So I think, look, we, we shouldn't have, look, of course there is, this is a summer activation plan. Uh, but we know your comments, but that's what I heard back, that there are going to be teams. If, if I could. Just responding um, to firstly Councillor Sturt's request, what the, the meetings that we've been having with the police are not just about the inner city, they're no. actually much more broadly based than that. Than that. Um, they are for example very concerned both around pay use and in the community, but equally, equally concerned about the growing level of domestic violence. And so the, the question has, has really been try, being explored as to how do we as an organisation support them in the work that they're doing. As that work actually moves forward, um, we're certainly a long way from landing any particular direction as, as yet, but we will certainly be actually bringing that back for you and, and will at that time also look to actually have the police report sort of report back to you their, their views as, as well and I'm sure when we report back equally the outcomes of the piece of work we're currently discussing, I'm sure they'll be keen to, to be present and to, to talk about their experiences working with us. Um, what I would emphasise is that this is actually a linked multi-agency response. It's not council doing its own thing, it is actually a completely inter integrated strategy <coughs> working with the police. So looking to the comment that you've made, Councillor Gould, the, the police are actually themselves looking to supplement the security teams. <coughs> so you will see police staff on the street working beside <coughs> our beside our our security staff on, on the street. The the thing of course that, that does is that it means <coughs> that you've got a pair, a two people, one a security security personnel and a, and a police officer together. So what you'll see is a much greater level of presence than what we have had before. Say, and, you're, and if you're asked, and we all are, as, as some of you mentioned, please report what you see as antisocial behaviour to the police, because that's part of this strategy. I wouldn't go and confront that behaviour personally. But you must do something. Councillor Bentley. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, do we still have the city guardians doing patrols? Absolutely. Yes, they do. They will be. They'll, they're continuing on as as they have done. Right. In, Councillor Puma. 
Is this another item of urgent business? Uh, no, we just wanted to add a, a little bit of, hopefully, um, value to this conversation that we're having. Um, I'm just, um, at, I applaud the police for yeah. engaging in this um, conversation, but um, probably um, Deputy uh, Mayor, Councilor Donaldson might be able to highlight this, that the police do start a lot of pilot programs and then after a little while it wanes. Maybe the sergeant's gonna change or personnel changes. And um, in the last 20 years of being in business around um, safety um, and, and being in the suburbs as well as in the city, this, it, it's been a, a very, it, it's been a letdown. But what we are trying to address over here is that these issues do, do happen. And um, like I said, you know, personal changes and then after a while something doesn't happen and then um, we'll get through, known through the media. Um, very correctly acclaimed um, a statement saying reported crime in Rotorua is down. It's because people think when they call the police, nothing's gonna happen. Um, it's, it's about the faith in the system. But right now, uh, when Reg did raise this issue, what was he referring to? Did he actually blunt it out in saying that they are just random people? Is it the beggars? Is it the homeless? Or who has been identified? No one is talking about who has been identified as being the... Um, I, look, I don't think we should get into that detail. Oh, that's okay. Then that, that's was, right. that was a letter he quite rightly sent to all councillors. That was very responsible to let us know so that we could consider his aspect along with everybody else's, he's not the only one. Um, and then the discussion followed with the police, with the plan. Um, so I don't think it's for us to go into the detail. Um, you've all seen the image. That was the image um, and it was telling a story. But I don't think that needs any more discussion really. You've got Councillor Gould? And have we closed on the other issue? But you had your hand up. Perhaps just a brief response, Your Worship. Um, so uh, I don't uh, disagree with anything uh, Councillor Gould observed in 38 years or 36 years of um, retailing and my 38 years in the police. These, these things come and, they, and go, these phenomena arise and, and they're addressed at the time. Um, and we got some very good, those of us uh, who attended the PARS AGM, got some very good insights into police strategies for reducing victimisation from Inspector Taikato recently. Um, so there are those forums there for, for connecting and understanding. I think it's very useful if the police can come back and speak to us in confidential at O&M um, next year um, on the results of this, uh, this initiative and, and where they're going in the future. But I do know that one of the challenges they do face, it's great to see that the current government is giving them more resource, uh, but they do face a recruiting challenge. So if anyone has connections who can assist in uh, steering the right people in that, in that direction, um, I know that the police would be very welcoming for it. Uh, that's about all I'd add. Cheers. Thank you, and thanks for the update, Jeff. And we'll put that on O&M in the future, the issues. Has captured them. You have another item of urgent business. Yes, Madam Chair, I've got two questions about legal matters which I want to put up in the confidential section of this council. So you're raising I it don't now. want to bring the questions to council now. That's all right. Thank you for flagging that now. There appears to be no more urgent items. Recommendations now. We go to the confirmation of council minutes on page seven of the previous meeting. Thank you. Seconded. Councillor Tapsell that the minutes of the meeting on the 22nd of November be confirmed as a true and correct record. Are there any corrections? There appear to be none. All those in favour, please say aye. Contrary? Carried. Now we move to the recommendations on Plan Change 5, Signs and Miscellaneous Changes, page 14. And I need a mover and a seconder to receive the report while Kate and Henry come to the table. Moved Councillor Hunt, seconded Councillor Gould, uh, that the following reports, I, I won't, 
Oh, recommendations on plan change five, sign and miscellaneous changes, and recommendations report from Independent Hearings Commissioner Greg Hill on proposed plan change five, attachment one. Uh, all those in favour, please say aye. Contrary, carried. Thank you, Kate and Henry. Kia ora, Madam Chair, and kia ora, Kato councillors. Um, look, Kate's going to take you through a brief presentation, um, but conscious that you haven't had this in front of you since 2017, I think, um, when you made a decision on the direction you want to follow with signs. Um, so since then, it's been through the public process, submissions have been made, um, the powers to, to consider the submissions and, and run the hearing if, if needed were delegated to a commissioner a few weeks ago to Greg Hill and he's now come back with his recommendations. Fundamentally, um, they support the, the direction you, you endorsed in 2017, subject to just a, a few, a few minor-ish tweaks. So I'll just get Kate to take you through it, so again, can remind you, um, we know there's quite a lot of paper in front of you, um, so hopefully she can, she can break it down simply and um, give you a steer. So the plan change, we covered off two issues with plan change. Signage was one topic, and the second topic was miscellaneous changes, and that was another <coughs> little tidy up of the things that pop out of a district plan that you realise you need to fix up. So I'll run through signs first, and then I'll go through the miscellaneous changes, and if you've got questions, please just ask. The approach to signs ended up being very, very simple. So site-related signs, you're advertising something, the name of your business, Site-related signs, um, that doesn't need consent as long as you comply with some conditions around that, which is relating to size, illumination, those kind of things. Um, the intention of that is to allow businesses to identify the activity on the site. It's all about directional signage. You're in the downtown, you want to know where a shop is, it's, that's what the, sign, the, the rules are about. Uh, the standards differ de depending on the zone, so you've got more permissive rules in the industrial and commercial areas and more restrictive rules in residential and rural areas, and that again is to protect amenity. Then the other side of it is non-site related signs require resource consent. Um, the rules differentiate between areas where signage, signage is going to be more strictly controlled, similar principles to the site related signs, high amenity areas, residential and rural, is a tough category of consent, so it's a non-complying activity, and statutory, the statutory test is quite difficult there. And also on the city entranceways, which is Tenai Road and Ferry Springs Roads, there's also a non-complying activity status because there's an awful lot of signage in those areas already. <coughs> and the other areas that aren't as sensitive to signs, so your commercial, industrial, business and innovation, and also your reserve, there's a discretionary activity status, so consent is required, might or might not be granted. Uh, so that's the basic framework. There's policies and assessment criteria to go alongside that when we're, when we're assessing resource consent applications. Um, the plan change needs to be seen in light of the wider approach that Council's taken to signage. So what Council has been working on for quite a while is there's multi-sign sign boards which are intended to enable, enable, sorry, enable community organisations and event organisers to advertise events that are coming up. Um, in a similar way to you have going into Taupo, you've got Ironman and all the upcoming events advertised. It's a coordinated location for signs to go. Um, I was speaking to the reserves team this morning. They were saying that before the end of this financial year, they're, intent, uh, they're anticipating some of those sign boards will go up. So that's the carrot and stick approach. If you're a community organisation, you can advertise on those community sign boards. If you're doing it anywhere else, then there's a mechanism for council to check those signs before those signs go up. Um, council's other mechanisms are poster stations around the inner city um, and information on the council and event fi vendor finder websites. Um, the overall intention is to reduce clutter and improve amenity. The other component of the plan change was miscellaneous changes, and they're, they're not overly exciting, but things like the earthworks rules, we included a time period. So within a rural zone, you can do a 1,000 cubic metres of earthworks, but there's no time in which you measured that 1,000 cubes. So now we've inserted a 12-month period. Um, 
There's a rule, a rule framework for temporary stockpiling, um, amendments in there to recognise concerns raised by federated farmers for farmers. Uh, heavy, heavy vehicle parking, which was the enforcement team getting complaints in the residential area about people <coughs> parking or with, on, on residential sites. Um, and some minor corrections. Oh, and subdivision connectivity provisions, which is all about, for example, Vaughan Road, making sure that when you get one subdivision, you don't block the site off from a subsequent subdivision next door, so you're getting better urban design, better communities. Um, so that was the, the, the crux of the plan change. And the, the process is very similar, well, exactly what Henry was just saying. We came to council in November last year. We notified it, the plan change at the same time as holiday rentals. Um, very low level of interest. We had five submissions received, no further submissions. We appointed an independent hearing commissioner. No submitters wanted to be heard, so there was no need for a hearing. The hearing commissioners now come back with the recommendations and the report in front of you. So we're now requesting, well, wanting to see if you're wanting to adopt the plan change. Uh, next steps after that, if, if you choose to go down it, is the appeals period, which means that anybody that's a submitter can appeal the plan change. Um, yeah. Questions that need clarifying, <coughs> Councillor Stewart. A question, and I wondered if I, and I thank you for your synopsis of, of Plan Change 5. Uh, I know that Councillor Hunt has a, an incredible, and Councillor Kent have incredible interest in the Plan Change. So I, I just want to ask them politically in terms of where this is headed. Is it on track and does it meet the needs of what we initially decided we would do in November last year? So I wonder if I could ask Councillor Hunt and Councillor Kent for their views on this. Happy, ha happy to comment. Um, as has been alluded to, it's been a whole year um, since we decided where we would go. And I think the fact that we had a extremely experienced independent commissioner overseeing this particular process. He brought knowledge and skills from around the country. And the fact that essentially there have been only minor amendments, then it um, says to me that what we went out with actually met community approval. There were only five submitters, none wished to be, to be heard, which obviously has streamlined the process. Obviously that will be dependent on, on further appeals, but I'm certainly very happy with where we've landed here today and encourage my colleagues to support the recommendations. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I agree with Karen, uh, and I commend uh, Greg Hill on a very, very thorough report. Uh, it's very straightforward. Uh, he's um, dotted the I's, crossed the T's. He's picked up a cu couple of little things that needed tweaking. Uh, I fully support it, and I'm quite happy to move that we adopt it. Councillor Kent's move in two, three, and four. You'll second that, Councillor Hunt. No further questions. I've just got one question on amenity values. Are you doing a look at tidying up? Because some of the signs that we've got up are, are pretty old and rickety. It, um, Your Worship, it's, it's probably a different question to a plan change question, but um, certainly we've got to be um, we've got to be doing that, and certainly if we're responsible, we need to um, be leading. Great, <coughs> Councillor Roko, take it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I know that one of the objectives, of, as I've just heard, was to reduce clutter. Um, I just wanted to ask you, in terms of the um, election hoardings, local government election time, and you know the hoardings that go up. And you look at some areas that are obviously on land approved by the council. Well, hell, there's a lot of clutter there. But this didn't look at that at all. That wasn't taken into consideration. Because that is clutter. I mean, I know it only happens every three years, but it's hardly, hardly attractive. So, but this didn't look at that at all. Just And it shouldn't. So there's different legislation that covers off electoral and local election mm -hmm. signage. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the premise there is that it is a short-term short mm -hmm. clutter. Yeah with a, a democracy benefit, so it's, yeah. But no, not covered by the plan change. Thank you. I could, I could actually say comment on that as well, because, you know, one, one is trying to reduce clutter, but the other one for a period of time is absolutely very unattractive. I mean, we all put them up, but I just wondered if that was looked at and it wasn't, it doesn't cover it. So thank you for that. Kia ora. So are you going to contribute to the clutter or aren't you? Okay, I think that's one question. 
your need to reduce the clutter, there are some significant signages in Rotorua which are very, very well done. The ones at Kota Corner, the one in Lake Road, the big... <coughs> That's not. They are, are fantastic signs, but there are others, and the biggest complaints we get uh, in the industry I'm in is non-site related, because we as real estate agents are controlled very strictly in terms of non-site related signage. And I get a lot of complaints where that is seen Someone just puts up a sign and it takes council six weeks to react and they, they ring me, I then ring the guy in, in here and um, things are done. So I'm pleased that, that that has been attended to as well. So I'm going to put the motion now, two, uh, two three and four. All those in favour, please say aye. Contrary. Carried. And congratulations. And again, this is showing the value of our Resource Consent <coughs> Committee uh, that pour over the detail. Thank you for doing that for us. So when the recommendations come back to us, they're usually pretty watered. I don't think we've changed one, but it's a good process. Right, we move now to staff reports, and the first on page 119 <coughs> is the recommendation one of the Rates Review 2018 the outcome of our initial review phases. Could I have a mover and a seconder to receive the report? Rate and review, Councillor um, Donaldson. Seconded, Councillor Hunt. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Contrary, carried. To Una and JP. Good afternoon, members. I'm largely going to take the report on the rating review as read. However, JP and myself are going to go through a bit of an overview um, and then spend a little bit of time just highlighting the outcomes of the review to this point. So <coughs> defining when to do a rating review um, and what will be reviewed is the key to undertaking a robust review. At the time um, that a review was requested, uh, these elements had not been established. But subsequent discussions decided upon undertaking a rating <coughs> review following the latest revaluations and the long-term plan, and whereby a process would be undertaken to identify what the problems are. The approach that was taken was identified and laid out for you in a paper that was taken to the Strategy, Policy and Finance Committee on the 9th of August, and that outline is uh, listed up there on the slide. So the process that was um, undertaken involved yourselves being involved um, in three elected member workshops where our Lakes Community Board and Rural Community Board and members of Tatato were also involved. And those uh, three workshops were undertaken on the 26th of September, 11th of October and 8th of November. The approach that was undertaken also involved nine focus group sessions with community people. And I'll go into um, the focus groups a little bit more detail later on. <coughs> so defining a rates review and what it is. Um, so this was um, an outcome of our first workshop. And a rating review is how we structure our overall rating system to share the rating allocation among all ratepayers. A rating review is not a review of the levels of service, of debt, of council expenditure, or of the project services or service levels. These are all areas that were well discussed and agreed upon in developing your long-term plan 2018 to 28. Councillors, I'll just take over for a couple of slides now. And um, really, I, I wanted to put up a, a couple of bits of information which really is, is quite important for understanding how we end up with some of the challenges we have around rating. And that's really um, when we get a lot of analysis done by external bodies. This comes from the taxpayers' union. Um, you often see it or presented in one light, as opposed to understanding actually the, the real information that sits behind it. So this is a very simplistic approach to say, obviously the average rate across our 25,000 odd residential properties is, is it $2,251. 
And, and this is where it stacks up on that league table with the other territorial authorities. What's not evident there is obviously the, the diversity and the composition of our district um, between urban and rural, but also how we've arranged our rates to try and address those issues of affordability and equity. So that distribution. So whilst this is um, useful for some people, um, it also highlights some significant gaps in information and understanding about rates that need to be addressed. So I, we just thought there's a couple of other ones I've put in here too, which is, it's just part of the reasons why as an outcome of this work, we really need to start focusing on some of that education around rates. And this is another one, and, and Councillor's apology, I scanned it, um, but you, you can't really see the detail. But if we just look at the title of the side, this is average annual growth in rates per capita across the territorial local authorities between 1996 and 2017. So this is, comes from Stats New Zealand, um, and it's not really important, um, the names of the different councils. But what is important is where Rotorua sits, and we're pretty well near the bottom. So again, this is one of those things that starts highlighting some of those gaps in information. So for a large proportion of our community, they would be saying, gosh, rates have gone up massively. But when you actually look at the real shifts in rates per capita in our district, they've been incredibly small for quite an extended period which again highlights the, the, the understanding issue that we have in our community. And really my next slide um, starts picking up on some of the things that are meant to be happening around rates rise, some of our costs of service. So the great shopping baskets of um, the world, so on the right is our consumer price index, which of course is that measure which everyone says it's close to inflation, but it's the price of the things we consume in our households. So in there is our medical expenses, our transport expenses, but most importantly, things like our groceries. Now, when you try and say council should have rate increases that follow inflation or follow the consumer price index, they kind of ignore the fact that actually we procure and spend and have different <coughs> cost drivers than a household. Yes, some of them we do. So there is power, there is fuel, there is insurance, uh, but for us, a lot of the other things that affect us significantly is um, what's happening in the construction industry, uh, the price of steel, and the price of construction activities in general. So there's a large, oh, and, and wage movements. So there's a significant range of other factors which create a, a difference between what our price and or cost increases are driven by and what's happening in our community. Again, a misconception within our community. Now, having shown our changes in rates um, as being quite low in that previous slide across those 20 years, this is really what came through so strongly in some of the focus groups again, was the view that our rates are shifting massively and people are receiving huge impacts because of things council's doing. But actually sometimes what's really driving on a three yearly cycle is those significant changes between sectors created by valuations. Um, so where people say, you said the average rate rise was going to be 5.7%, why did I get 10, why did I get 15? Um, and, and this is often the reason. So it's those valuation changes that occur every three years. And if we just look back at this graph, um, it it's probably needs to have the in-between in years removed, but that year between 11, 12 and 12, 13, we changed from a land value rating system to a capital value rating system. Uh, that was a year when there was probably the most pronounced movement in those different sectors. So that created the framework and the transition arrangements that we had to put in place between those two years. So there was a lot of band-aids that went on the system as we changed from land value to capital value. So over time those have been removed, but again you can see there was a, a small change back at the last revaluation. But whilst we haven't had the kind of level we did back in 11-12, 
there still has been a, a pronounced sort of change between those sectors, which drove some of those big shifts in rates. So again, this is part of that information and education that the community needs to have about what sometimes drives the shifts in their rates. Um, and again, looking back at those other slides, it's some of that information that we have to get out there and help our community understand. One of the conversations that led through all of the workshops was discussions around principles and having some really fundamental um, principles for defining a good rating framework. These principles become the foundation for a review and become the, the testers and the things that uh, we look upon to ensure that any changes or uh, subsequent reviews um, hold in place these principles. And we've got them listed um, up there and they're also in your paper, so I won't go through them individually. Just going to spend um, a moment just to uh, reflect upon the focus groups and the work that was undertaken in those sessions. So these were small but diverse groups of people um, from our community. These are people that put themselves forward to come in and have a conversation um, and to be a part of um, quite a unique approach um, in terms of sharing with us their experiences perceptions and understandings that they themselves had around the current rating um, framework. There was an interesting um, spread of people in terms of age, their location and even the types of properties that they owned. And throughout those conversations, a number of areas um, came out and they've been sorted through um, and grouped into these various um, themes or issues. They, they focused around affordability, the issues with short-term accommodation. We've themed together um, a sector, sector issues. The issues around targeted rates, should there be, maybe be more of them. Equity, um, and equity was linked very closely with affordability and the rating of Maori freehold land. And we've got there, in the pie graph there, um, you can see that sort of breakdown of, um, from the entire group, uh, what was probably the, the more important in terms of the perceived uh, issues there. And councillors, this was just brought forward to just remind you of where we got to in that last workshop uh, before we brought this report back to you. And really a case of picking up on the issues that Una raised there around those principles. And tying to those principles, we, we introduced that discussion about needing to understand the composition of our community. So really looking in at uh, the variable incomes and also that view of the deprivation that exists across our city but also across our region. So again, that was to highlight some of those areas, particularly in the Western Heights, Fortlands area, with significant levels of deprivation. But of course, that does not ignore the fact that other areas such as Mamaku, Kaingara, uh, Repara, and out sort of the Northern Lakes are also areas with, with challenges in that deprivation space. And of course, on, on the right-hand side, again, councillors, you can see there's that graph that we introduced to you, and I know it's recorded within the report too, which was really just to look at how we've allocated rates as a, and how it actually comes through as a percentage of the value of a home. So the, the red dots in there, particularly centred around Fordlands, where because of our fixed charges, we have a particularly high percentage of rates then against the total value of property. So that mismatch of the level of rates against property values, but also that overlay of deprivation there. So one of those key affordability issues for us to really examine and look at. And really the, the graph at the bottom was to say, look, over time, we're continuing to see the, the charges increasing around our fixed elements, so our fixed rates which again starts affecting those on the lower incomes or with the lower value properties most. So that was a pretty important issue for us to start looking at. So really that led us to that recommendation and the conclusion then that is one of the outcomes of this review 
we really do need to look at um, the level of the UAGC and our fixed charges because they do create this, this weighting to the lower value properties and, and often some of our most deprived <coughs> communities. So we need to look at how we at least maintain that, those levels um, as rates increase or ideally start reducing the, the amount or the impact of those fixed charges within our total rating bill for properties. So that was probably the first recommendation, or the first recommendation that had come out from that work, really around trying to be very clear about that equity and the affordability issues we were trying to address. So the other one, councillors, which, which came through extremely strongly, and um, Mr Griffiths spoke a lot about the, the number of times uh, the short-term accommodation and the availability of rental properties was identified within the different focus groups, you know, being an absolutely significant issue. And really what I've just done here is grabbed a couple of those graphs we showed you, which really has shown the significant growth in the number of properties listed within Airbnb over the last few years, and really how it's moved. Um, we used to have a lot of booker batch around the lakes, which was seen as pretty normal. Um, really the issue has now moved into the city and that's created impacts on the available rental stock uh, but also accommodation for students and, and families um, and it also contributed to driving up the rents. So, so that was just to highlight what has changed significantly for us probably in the last sort of two to five years um, and has become quite a, a topical issue for our community. So really the, the key results of this was that the Chief Financial Officer was going to go away and look at how um, strongly we um, create the compliance around our current 100 day threshold. Uh, certainly a lot of the discussions, particularly within the accommodation sector group, was that was too high a threshold. And so what was also proposed is that really for us there's a, a significant piece of work and a number of other councils have undertaken that where we need to talk with those different stakeholder groups and start exploring whether the 100 days threshold needs to be reviewed and what and how might that be undertaken. So that's, a, that's an ongoing piece of work within this rates review. The next one, councillors, was, was really a, a particularly strong set of issues um, that came out of the Māori Trust uh, focus groups. So um, there was a lot of questions raised about Māori economic development, uh, the impacts of remission policies, um, how that supported or proved to be a disincentive to development or investment, uh, and also the desire to see some sort of additional information about Māori land identified. We were in a position where it was very difficult for us within our own rating system to identify those Māori land blocks and understand exactly what they were. We often had to go off to the Māori land court records to, to confirm or look at the types of land. So really the, our first action that's really come out of that is, and the reason why there's the, the arrow between information gap and those questions that were raised in that focus group, is we need to do some research. We need to get a better understanding of the Māori land, its composition, its characteristics, its ownership, uh, and, and that provides us with a sound base on which to explore some of those other issues like remission policies. So a significant amount of work for us to, to begin in that process. So really that's the other significant piece of ongoing research work that's required from the rates review. And um, I touched earlier uh, about the, the question around uh, education and, and one, of the, one of the things that came out quite strongly is uh, a lot of people know a little, um, but very few people know enough um, about their rates considering it is such a significant uh, expenditure item and everyone has an opinion on it. Uh, not too many people really understand how it works and how it's allocated. So for us, like many other local authorities, we really do need to look at how we provide better information and help individuals get an understanding of, of the whys and the hows of rates. So that's a pretty major one for us as well. So councillors, just summarising there, the, the four distinct pieces of future work for us is that ongoing reduction of the Uniform Annual General Charge with a view that that needs to at least match increases in the fixed or targeted rates. Um, and, and look, I've put in there also that this creates the need for that ongoing discussion with the rural 
and lakes community boards where some of those most significant changes are occurring in those fixed charges as new sewage schemes are created, yeah. but also in relation to some of those deprived communities. So that's a pretty important affordability and equity question that is ongoing in that space. Mentioned the research around our information on Māori freehold land. Um, obviously, um, the Chief Financial Officer's progress around the enforcement of the current 100-day threshold for short-term accommodation but also a more comprehensive engagement with the accommodation sector um, at its widest to really start mapping out what's good, bad or um, needs to be addressed in that space and, um, and clearly also what's happening in some of the other parts of the country where there's similar tourism pressures that we have. And finally, um, wrapping all that up in, a, in an educational programme to keep lifting awareness and understanding of rates. So, councillors, I think that's pretty much it. Um, we're both happy to answer any questions. We've got a question first from Councillor Donaldson, then Councillor Stewart. Thank you, Worship, through you. JP, um, pleased to see the ongoing work regarding the, um, uh, the UAGC and, and the affordability issues. And one, as you touched on, one of the key affordability issues is the capital cost of uh, particularly the wastewater schemes in the, in the lakes and rural communities and um, some years ago at an LTP, I don't know whether it was the one prior to this or the one before that, I raised the issue of, um, uh, it was when the Tarawera scheme was first being discussed about whether we shouldn't as a council look at the $1,500 subsidy that we paid and I forget when we first brought that in but I think it was about Long time. To prior to my time on council in 2007. But I note with your graphs on inflation and so forth that um, they've, they've moved and the CPI is, and the construction has certainly moved, but that subsidy has never changed. It's remained flat and the lakes enhancement rate has moved maybe one or two dollars over that time. Um, We've gone cap in hand to regional council because they've got more debt headroom on their balance sheet, or they've had in the past, but now they're facing some challenges themselves. Uh, and, uh, but my point was, in any case, if we go to them, they target rate that, that back to our ratepayers anyway um, in the Bay of Plenty region part of our district. So are you going to look at um, at whether there is a case to increase that subsidy to help some of those future schemes such as Mamaku and Tarawera um, and whether we could do that by starting to move on the lakes enhancement rate and, and tickle that up a bit um, to address whether there's not a case for a, a greater subsidy just to recognise inflation and the affordable issue, issues they're facing out there. Through you, Worship, I think it's a bit of a challenging question. I think that's what comes back to here is the conversation about um, is, is that the right approach? We set in place a policy that is applied to a number of sewage schemes already. Um, I think as we start getting towards these last few sewage schemes where there is not the, the government subsidies available, uh, the costs of those schemes are now becoming significantly higher. And, and I suppose that, that becomes the, the driver for whether you as an elected body want to talk about whether there needs to be an additional district-wide subsidy or not. Um, but the, the key there is the, the, the reflection back on those who have gone before and are carrying um, sort of 10, 15 years' worth of capital contributions still to go. Um, and what you create by changing that policy. So the, the question's a political one. Is, it, is that something that's considered next year, though? You say this is an ongoing piece of work. That would get wrapped up in that, wouldn't it, JP? I think the subsidy yeah. came in with the Swiss scheme when government came in in part. Was it earlier than yeah. that? Yeah. yeah, it came in. The first scheme that we did for the lakeside settlements was uh, Rotoma, uh, oh, sorry, Rotoiti Lake at Kawa Bay. Jeff, do you want to Otherwise, comment? it wouldn't have happened. If I can make a comment to that, and JP, could you flip back to the heat maps that you had on the screen a little while ago? The, the point that I was going to make is that um, this, the, these diagrams represent a, a particular challenge, and that 
as you increase any type of fixed charge level, you, you're effectively driving, as you can see, the rate distribution in a particular way. Um, so if you increase those fixed charge for whatever reason, then effectively you are targeting actually some of the some of our population that are actually least able to afford rates. Um, it's very, I think it, the, prop, the challenge is that it's very easy to assume a group of ratepayers is somehow or other in a disadvantaged situation and apply the ethos that if we spread the cost across the many to supplement a few, it will actually be a fair and equitable outcome. Um, but as you can see, clearly evidenced in the top right hand chart, it's actually not a fair and equitable outcome because what you actually do is to drive rates un inequitably into, into the population in a way that they don't necessarily equate to the sort of the outcome you're trying to achieve. And just a reminder that these were the issues that we're um, passing today that came out from the workshops. So those are the ones that we're resolving to move forward on. Um, I've got Charles Sturt, Mark Gould, and then Charles. Yeah, one of the things for me during this whole process having issues of fairness and equity, and I'm delighted with the recommendations because Una, you and um, the light's gone out on me. Yeah. Uh, there, not for the first time this year. Um, <laughs> Uh, can I just say um, one of the things I'm pleased that you've picked up from those public forums, from the volunteers who came through, the issues that were consistently aired by politicians as well, those issues of fairness and equity. One of the things in the industry that I'm involved with is you get these Auckland and Hamilton investors coming into Rotary and they say, God, your rates are unbelievably expensive. And I said, uh, which part? And they say, well, the rates bill for this house is $3,800. And I said, and she said, mine in, in Auckland is only two nine. And I said, and how much is your water on top? Oh, 1800 a year. Oh, I mean, rest my case. What's your question? My question is, <laughs> when we read about the $2.2 million capital sales just recently in the Daily Post block last week, We've also got to be mindful that we've got sales at 180,000 in Western Heights as well. And the issues of fairness and equity, based on what Jeff has just talked about, yeah, be careful. whether the house is worth 2.2 or 180,000, they still incur similar costs because people live there. Yeah. So getting that balance <coughs> and the perceptions um, is the, is the education part that you've highlighted in, in, in the recommendation. So I'm delighted that the sector, we're going to review the Airbnb because that is the area that I'm getting the most complaints about, yeah. where people believe they, they bought a house in a residential area, not next door to a motel, with 20 or 30 people staying there of a weekend. At the houses can't cope and neither can the community. So that's so what came out. That's what's going to come out with the 100-day review. Okay, that's all I wanted to know, that that was going to happen. Um, Mark Gould. Madam Chair, um, thank you for your report today. I'm concerned with the wording on 2A. It states here reduce the uniform annual general charge over time to maintain slash reduce level of impact of additional fixed charges. What it means, if you bring down the UAGC charge, some other sector or somebody else in the rating system would be paying extra because mm -hmm. rates never come down. What, what's your question? The well, question is that should the wording be changed because I can't see that the rates of this council ever coming down, Madam Chair. <laughs> Get you, are you asking me? That's right. Uh, through your worship, uh, I think the intention in there was to say we are reducing a, a portion of the rates charges called the uniform annual general charge. So that's the maintain the level of the UAGC or reduce it as one of the aspects of the rates. Um, it, and you're correct, it moves it to the general rating allocation piece, which is done on value. Councillor Coomer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, JP. Um, my question is um, too, um, while we talk about uh, some of these areas which are lower socio-economic areas, maybe the Kotus, the, um, the Ford Blocks, 
How do we understand that a uh, lot of those houses are actually not investor houses? People that are, are living in there are just rentals. So the people that are owning the house as, as investors, surely they can afford it. That's, that's one of my questions. Uh, how do we know that? And the other question is uh, on the short-term accommodation, this 100-day um, introduction, if we, we get it. Are, are these short-term accommodation providers actually, uh, as a tourist town, fulfilling an obligation that um, we can provide beds for them and also are paying rates also anyway? Your Worship, there's a couple of questions here, and, and probably the first one is, and we, we've spoken often about the, the simplicity of the tools we have to allocate rates. Um, the Rating Act doesn't enable us to, to consider um, ownership of, of a home and whether you actually live in your home or not, or whether it's a rental. Um, I think one of the graphs we presented actually during the workshop um, did highlight um, the the what we saw is the proportion of homes occupied by the owner, um, and and whilst Fordlands was uh, had a higher high proportion of uh, rentals, uh, so did a number of other areas of the city. So um, it, it's it's very problematic to to sort of um, try and say that lower socioeconomic is rentals and therefore it's okay, um, because there is still a fairly significant proportion of home ownership in there, um, and so we also highlighted during those workshops, also within those suburbs, uh, reasonably low household income levels. So um, whether the, the individuals are paying their own mortgage or paying for their own home or renting, uh, there is still a, 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 a quite a significant proportion of house costs coming through for those for those properties. Um, and, and I say, I think the, the area, and I might be corrected, but I'll, I'll say it anyway, that the area of highest rental was actually some of Glenholm. So, um, so not necessarily where we normally would expect. So, so there is quite um, a difficult issue in that space. The last one about um, homes being used for short-term accommodation. Uh, you're certainly right. A, a family comes in and uses a house, um, and everyone uses a house in the same way. Uh, however, when you're operating a home as a short-term accommodation um, provider, you're also taking advantage of um, a number of other expenses that you're not picking up. So we charge businesses a differential of 1.72, I think it is, as well as the business and economic development targeted rate, which helps market and promote our district as a destination. So um, for all of those homes that are advertised and marketed as short-term accommodation, they're not quite paying for all the services they, they benefit from. And, and I think that was why where those who are used for more than 100 days, and again, this question of that threshold, are significantly benefiting within that accommodation sector without paying the same uh, level um, as a hotel or a motel. Okay. So, Madam Chair, can I just thank, uh, thank you so much, JP, for that um, thorough explanation. So just as a supplementary to my first question, on um, the socio-economic area. Rotorua also has a very high aging population, and those are the people that don't have an income. So, and they are house owners, homeowners as well. They have no other source of income to now supplement charges. Were they taken into the equation as to where, if there was any remission offered to them or not? I, to that, there are Yes, you worship. So that there is the option of the rates remission. But um, if, if you recall, we also looked at the distribution of rates within the district. And I'm just flick to the pages on page one, two, three of the agenda. We tried to show the proportion of properties that fell within a particular um, value band, and um, the vast majority of properties sort of also came within a sort of under 600,000, I think it was 85% of properties were under 600,000. And one of the exercises that we undertook with you and we did with the focus groups was to also ask people what they thought the rate should be against a number of different property values. If you recall the exercise, there was a little um, bars representing properties from values of about 270 odd thousand dollars right through to a million and you were just asked to consider what did you think the rate should be. 
um, whilst we can't identify specifically inside a household, that the idea was that as values increase, um, proportionally so should the um, value or the charges for their rates. Uh, where ours are flattened because of the size of our UAGC, but also our fixed charges. So um, in thinking about those of low value properties, uh, we're also cognizant then of the impacts on older people and the majority of those, uh, majority of those, many of those who will be in the lower value properties or flats and units. So they, so by keeping our fixed charges down to address that general affordability and equity issues, we should be assisting those on fixed incomes. We sort of be visiting the workshop again yep. actually. I think we've got to be careful because we did cover all of this in the workshop, but however, Karen Hunt? Um, JP, I just wondered, um, V, which is the commencement of the short-term um, enforcement for the accommodation and the engagement, whether um, what period of time you would expect that to take and uh, are you in, uh, envisaging a submission process <coughs> on that? Um, so is that likely to happen in the 2019 year or is that likely to happen in the 2020 year? I mean, obviously you haven't done the work yet, so I appreciate there is um, a bit of guesswork in this. Um, from memory, I think the paper actually um, distinguishes between two separate pieces of work okay. around that one. Yes. So the, there's one piece that will actually um, almost commence immediately, and that is around the how can we enforce or what's the compliance around the 100-day rule. The second one is for um, the partnership advisors, JP and myself, to actually sit down and work on uh, what an engagement plan might look like in terms of working with the sector. So we um, we are envisioning that the work around um, reviewing those rules or how we might go about it um, uh, is based around targeted engagement with that particular sector. And we would look to bring that engagement plan and the timing and everything back to you. And I think I suggested February, March for that, um, and at that time it would set out what the timing um, would be within that too. I think um, probably, and certainly with the Lakes Community Board here, there is a significant difference in requirements and desire for those communities, and currently we've got a blunt one size fits all, so that's I think an area that really needs to be um, um, examined, so I'm very pleased to hear that, and pleased to hear it, that that it's on a short, short lead in. Thank you. I think with your that and your education strategy, um, there are all of the rates, uh, lakes rate pay groups, AGMs in January. It'd be quite good to have a handout or something. I know it's a week before Christmas, yeah. but we go to rate pay meetings on the 2nd of January. I'm not sure, just speaking to the um, education um, collateral uh, program and that, yes. the timing we were looking at there um, is to tie in with going out with the annual plan. So regardless of, of, um, of whether we up. have, yeah, so have that awareness package because an annual plan will lead into what my, my rates look like for the next financial year. So having that education around, well, what services, what do I get for my rates? Why am I being um, targeted this way to go parallel with that? Um, I, we would not be able to turn um, an education uh, collateral <coughs> around for, for January we'll just, at We'll give stage. a heads up. Yeah. <laughs> Councillor Kent. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I, I support what's being proposed here. In particular, uh, I, I'm behind the uh, idea of heading towards the reduction of UAGC. Uh, the reason being is it will tend towards, in the future, giving relief at the bottom end of the market, which is where it is most needed. And that's, that's very, very clear. I also think that uh, Councillor Donaldson has actually raised a very interesting point concerning the way subsidies, because if you do a quick uh, think about it, a $1,500 subsidy on something that cost $10,000 10 years ago or 20 years ago is not the same as giving a $1,500 subsidy on something that's now costing $30,000. And I think in, in reality we should be looking at the subsidy is a percentage of the cost, not a fixed amount. So maybe we can build that into our future um, investigations into the impact of additional fixed charges.
Uh, we will note that, and I suppose this is this is the challenge with the rating. It, the, what you're talking about there, Rob, is actually the other side of the coin. Um, it's the how do we fund those projects, and they become conversations that we take forward into the next annual plan or subsequent LTPs. So definitely noted, um, and the project teams, um, when we come back to you with conversations around annual plans and LTPs, and I'm trying to find the Chief Financial Officer, but to see whether I got the nod from him, um, but we would bring that back to you that way. Monty. Monty's not the chief one. <laughs> uh, Peter Binney. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <laughs> just with your invited focus group feedbacks that you had, when you were discussing the short-term accommodation, did they actually come up with um, an indication of satisfaction with the 100-day rule, or did they come up with other suggestions? Uh, one of the things we got from the motel association prior to the actual focus groups was um, some analysis they have done of some of the other policies in other parts of the country. Uh, so they felt our 100 day threshold was too high and they um, indicated their interest in what was happening in Auckland uh, and in Queenstown. So those are the two they referenced which have much lower thresholds and um, actually have also have a stepped approach to um, the charges that are imposed. So that was done outside of the focus groups. Within our focus groups, um, councillors, we've, we've described to you before the mixed groups. So we had representatives of Airbnb, also Airbnb owners, moteliers, hoteliers and um, B&B owners. Um, there was a, a view that um, it wasn't right and an acceptance across the focus group that um, there needed to be further conversations in that space. That was as far as they went um, as a collective, but certainly once we got into um, the other focus groups, and, and I mentioned it during that presentation, it was probably the most mentioned issue because it was certainly prominent in a lot of people's minds. Um, sometimes because a, a home that had been um, occupied by a family nearby was now listed as an Airbnb, and suddenly they saw this sort of um, rolling impact into suburban areas. So they raised it, they didn't necessarily raise the, the um, thresholds or the rating approach, more of the, the social impact. Okay, uh, I think we should really be asking questions about process here. <coughs> Councillor Donaldson? You wish if I was just going to, uh, so I'm happy to move to oh. A, B, C and D. Great, do I have a seconder? Councillor Sturt? All those in favour, please say aye. Contrary, carried. So that enables you now to go forward. Well done. Thank you. And now we move to the next item, page 131. Uh, do I have a mover that the report, the Ministry of Business Innovation and Employment Contracts for Rotorua Lakefront Development and Whakariwariwa Forest Projects be received? Moved by Councillor Maxwell, seconded by Councillor Hunt. All those in favour, please say aye. Contrary, carried. JP, would you like to? Thank you, Your Worship. Your Worship, you'll notice that we've we've tried to split um, this item in two. So obviously we have two tenders uh, for your consideration within the confidential part, but also within the confidential section of our agenda you have the contracts in full for the Provincial Growth Fund. So councillors, what we did though, wanted to make sure that in the public area or public forum, you had the opportunity to, to look at the, the background and how we've got to the current place we are, but also to broadly set out the, the funding terms that have been identified through the Provincial Growth Fund. And probably most importantly, You'll see there the reference that uh, we, we have a, a grant offering of $19.9 million for the lakefront. So that's to match the council's 20.1. And uh, so councillors, that's the first part. Um, again, I've said it previously, that's the largest single grant being received so far in the country. And it really was based on the view that uh, the, Government and MB officials saw, like us, that this is a, a pretty important project for transformation 
of the lakefront and the adjoining area economically. So whilst we have aspirations to significantly lift the lakefront for our community, they also saw their opportunity to contribute to some quite significant economic outcomes for the city. So Council, that's, that's the first one and probably the simpler one. Now I've got a, um, a correction to make to um, the forest project figures. So, yep. so just, um, just an overview what I'm saying there, and it's covered actually in the purpose piece. So councillors, we, we spent some time talking to MB, who saw this project not being a $15 million project, but actually seeing it as a $14 million project. So what they asked us to do was to not include some parts of the works that we'd proposed, which were um, on our roading network. So on that basis, they sort of said, look, um, if you're going to do works on Tarawera Road to improve safety and in turning into Long Mile mm -hmm. and into Forest Hub 2, yeah. uh, that's actually, um, there's another part of government that you talk to. Um, and <laughs> so you another. can't really double dip in that space. So, um, so that turned this project back to a $14 million project. Um, now, I've put forward in here that the potential there is that this funding for council, which should set aside at 7.5 million across the three years, yeah. could be reduced to 7 million. Um, but the correction I'd like to make here is that it's going to cost us approximately $500,000 to do the entranceway into um, Longmile off Tarawera, so improving the road safety at that point, and also into Forest Hub 2. Now that half a million is the cost if we do not receive any support through NZTA. So whilst I've signalled in the report that we would be saving um, $500,000 um, based on the fact that it's a seven million match to seven, um, at this stage I would like us just to be clear that the half a million dollars may be required for those entranceway funding. Um, and any reductions would be based on an NZTA, NZTA subsidy, so that's the basis there. The other key points in the way the support has been split by government for the forest project is that um, $5.5 million comes through as a grant and one point five million comes through as a loan to be repaid over 10 years. So the basis there is that the $1.5 million loan is interest free for five years and then after that it's, uh, it's I think, uh, the government's borrowing plus a, plus a margin. Um, so it comes in pretty close to our interest rate for the remaining five years. Now the, the view of government there was that um, even though we're investing in the private inf infrastructure, the underlying land ownership in the forest is um, iwi and so there is... Um, private commercial gains to be received through um, this public investment as a leverage for private investment. So hence the, the condition around a loan, um, but also detailed, and, and I'd prefer to talk to about it in more detail in the confidential section, is a, a windfall clause, which is to say if the revenues for the forest um, exceed a, a significant uplift, uh, they would also like to share in the gains for that, so would like an additional return of funding of a uh, million dollars of the grant as well. So that puts a little more complexity into the discussions we've had around that provincial growth fund uh, contract, mm. and also uh, more significantly involved our partners in um, okaying that. So that's the sort of the process we're involved in in that space. So um, as I say the report also details the history of where these projects originated from and probably the most significant of course is the lakefront which commenced right back in 2008 and what I've done at that point is just to provide some history there too of what the original Rate and Associates plans were, um, their estimates back in 2008 and um, I think they identified the costs at approximately 28,000, but there was a significant number of exclusions that came through there, which actually would have put the project closer to 35 to 50 million dollars at the time. Um, and then, due to um, a not complete partner agreements into the subsequent long-term plan, only 10 million dollars was included within that next LTP, which was intended to only pay for what 
was a significant jetty redevelopment in that process. So, and the LTP following that, it was removed, and so really this project started again as a result of the 2016 Vision 2030 refresh. So happy to answer any general questions, but um, just concerned that anything particularly detailed needs to go into the confidential section. Are there any questions? Councillor Donaldson. Um, it's not a question, Your Worship, but through you, JP, um, and I know the answer to this, but just to confirm that the, in respect of the treatments on Tuttleware Road that are not funded through the PGF, uh, or not subsidised through the PGF, uh, they are, that both these projects are in the Regional Transport Plan, and uh, it's on the radar of NZTR to be coming to them for funding assistance rate. Absolutely. Yes, um, Your Worship, but one of the, the things that have been put in place um, around the Provincial Growth Fund is um, a large number of departments now have oversight uh, into the implications of these projects. And um, for us to, through that um, the Regional Land Transport Plan, these projects had to be accepted and recognised, so absolutely correct. Any other questions? Councillor Stewart? The, um, thank you for the report, JP. It goes, uh, it is quite wide ranging, and I, um, I think the two headings on page 132 and 133 regarding the lakefront development and the Whakarewerewa forest development um, give us the uh, sequence of events that went on in terms of signalling this project to the community putting the application into the PGF, the PGF coming back and saying, providing you do, you put in this amount, as signalled in your LTP, we will come to the party, and that's been approved by central government. Um, on page 135, it does mention a petition that was received at the last council meeting, of which it states that 1,482 of a growing population of 74,500 people, which is less than 2% of our population have signed that petition. But I see further on in the um, agenda, and I don't want to reveal anything, Madam Chair, I'm absolutely cognizant of the confidentiality matters, but later in the confidentiality section, we are asked to approve contracts for the Forest Hub and Long Mile development, which are without revealing them, going to two companies, one of which is locally owned, and the other one who is locally based, they employ a significant number of our local people. And uh, I think to stop midstream would be a travesty in terms of that. And if we do stop, I don't know where we're going to get the $811,000 to repay the initial contract spent on providing the business case because we haven't budgeted f to repay that. Um, so I, um, I, I signal the fact that um, I'm happy to move two and that we, we, we get going and, and uh, we'll talk about that in confidential as well. I'm happy to move, Madam Chief. You second. You, you moved. Yes. One and two. Thank you. Councillor Kent. Thank you, Your Worship. <coughs> Whilst I'm right behind the uh, lakefront development, and I say that quite openly, uh, I still have some major reservations in, in mind as to where this figure of 40 million has actually come from. Is this a figure actually plucked out of the blue? Because we've only got a concept at this stage. Now, are we signing, yes, we're going to spend 40 million no matter what it ends up at, or are we uh, uh, approving on the basis of, well, if it only costs us 30 million, we're only going to fork out 15? For, so, could you clarify that, please? Uh, you, you wish it, the, the, the Concerns raised by the councillors are absolutely correct. Well, at this stage, we, we do our best with moving from a concept to uh, a more, prelim more pre preliminary design. Okay. So we've, we've moved from the, the, the high-level concept to preliminary worked design. Uh, and one of the things that was part of the output of our current 811,000 was to go right through to detailed design for tendering, certainly of um, the, the lakefront zone between the current operators and just past the um, Scout Den site. So um, 
we've started to get right down into that detail, but again, uh, you often don't know how much things will cost, even though we've done QS at each of these stages, and we've had to um, and identify who our QS company will be, and they are cited within the contracts, because that's important that we have the kind of quality QS supporting the information we've got. Uh, the, the structure of the contracts talks about the deliverables in each of those areas. So at any point that we receive, and it's, and it's eating the elephant piece by piece, uh, we've got to value engineer, review, and make sure each part of the project is delivered to a, a level that supports the outcomes we're trying to achieve with government. Uh, if that creates savings through each of the stages, then you're correct, we will not spend 40 million. Um, the intention is also uh, that 40 million is the limit, and so if any particular stage we accept a, a higher cost because um, either the tendering or the design requirements require it, uh, we've got to then look at the value engineering through the subsequent stages because we're working towards a maximum budget of 40. Um, but if um, by, by good management, uh, good understanding of the costs, uh, or good tenders, and we come in under, um, it, we will not spend the full amount. Thank you. Councillor Maxwell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, yeah, no, I'm more than happy to be supporting this petition, right, uh, this, not petition, this recommendation from the beginning, but I do want to ask a question rather than getting into some of the things I... I support in that in here. The question I have is, we had the long-term LTP um, consultation and feedback and support strongly for the project. The question I have is, why are we even considering this petition? I, well, no, the report says we had to consider. We're not. That's, hmm? Do you want to answer that, Chief? Um, Councillors, I think what you have before you today is actually fundamentally a sign-off on the agreement with the Ministry. Um, that, that's primarily what this paper is actually asking you to, to review and to approve. Um, the reason that the petition has actually also been included, or information on the petition, is that it is actually directly a matter that's directly related in which you've received information. So staff are merely including the nature of or the summary of some aspects of the petition in this report for your consideration as you make the decision to proceed or not. But that's due process on receipt of a petition. Councillor Rokoate. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the report. And um, obviously these two projects, as has been detailed here, um, unlock the potential for Rotorua, so that's good news. Yeah. But I have to say that um, under five there, the lakefront, Rotorua lakefront development, the most significant point for me is bullet point two, improved iwi land development and value. Over all the years, um, the lack of opportunity for iwi to develop their land, uh, be it because it was, um, some of it was taken under the Public Works Act, um, some of it was given as reserves, springs, the water was used, and all of those sort of things, and for various reasons, the opportunity has never been there significantly to develop their lands, and I just think that is just so significant. It sends a clear signal that um, the develop, and, and of course, as we know, iwi development is for the benefit of everyone in Rotorua, has always been, um, but this, uh, this does say something. It says it's a clear signal to the community that Iwi land is valued in terms of its contribution to the whole economic growth of our city and the people who live and reside here. So that to me is, I mean, all of those bullet points are really significant, but the one for me that stands out so long overdue um, is that bullet point too. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, uh, you wish. I'm just wondering, if, are you taking comments on the uh, recommendation at this stage or just any questions? And I do have a comment <coughs> when you're ready. Chair, 2.2 states contracts with an S. Does that mean we've got two separate contracts or one contract covering both? Um, one three one 
on page 131 2.2, there's contracts with an S listed in 2.2. Does that mean there's... Sorry? Can it be... Can 2.2 then be um, voted on separately, one for the lakefront and one for the Waka? You're going into the confidential section. I think if you look at the resolution, we're approving this and then we go into the details. Of order, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, Councillor Gord is actually quite correct because the way point two is stated at the moment, you're giving support to both projects. Some councillors may not wish to support both. Didn't signal that. We've got a motion on the table. You've got a motion on the table. Just raise a point of order. The two contracts that are detailed at the back of the page in the confidential, one is for Long Mile Road and the other is for the Forest Hub 2 development. It has nothing to do with the, the lakefront. So I, I, if we split those up, that means a double negative against what we've already approved at LTP level. Yeah, that's right. Right. Um, the next, I don't, I don't think there were any more I questions. Think, I think Dave had a at the end of going to comment. Thank you, Your Worship. I just wanted to make a couple of comments, but firstly I'll comment on the, the issue that's just been raised about splitting. There's another vote that happens in confidential, right. and so that, that can be addressed there. Um, and so councillors can choose to support both or not support both. As Councillor Sturt said, they were supported at LTP. Um, I'd just like to um, add that both of these projects were endorsed by the Bay of Connections as part of the Regional Visitor Economy Strategy uh, for the Bay of Plenty and for the uh, Sub-Regional um, Visitor Economy Strategy for Rotorua. The Economic Development Portfolio Group met last week and um, uh, absolutely endorsed um, proceeding with the, with the projects. They're fully in support. Um, just in terms of, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll save my other comments, uh, I think, when we come to the, uh, the confidential section around the uh, MB contracts, Your Worship, but I do want to just touch on the petition. Um, so I note the petition, um, I note the numbers in the petition, and a significant number of those who signed are not local people, um, not even New Zealanders. Um, and I do also... Um, have had a significant number of people approach me about what was put to them when they were asked to sign that petition. And there were issues such as, there's going to be no playground left on the lakefront, or do the museum first, which you know we're working on anyway, and other things like that. So I, I fully support um, the recommendation that's in front of us here. And as the mover of the motion, you have right, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, Peter. I haven't forgotten you. Sorry, I'm reminded. Right, be Thank you, Councillor Bentley. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I've got a couple of questions with regard to the petition. And the first one is, why were the reasons why the people signed the petition not discussed and questions by the councillors not permitted? Because he ran out of time, wasn't it? Uh, it was purely on basis. This, it's a standing order, Councillor Bentley, and we were very <coughs> particular to keep to the standing order. The submitter of the petition was advised, you have five minutes. He went over, he went to the time, and then offence was taken, and under standing orders that ruled out any right for questions. That's standing orders, and we had to be very careful. That's why Councillor Bentley, when you first tried to submit the petition, we asked for it to come back at a later date so that we were very clear to stick with standing orders. Right, Councillor Sturt. I also um, wanted to highlight to members that if they'd had taken time out to come to the Chamber of Commerce business after five, there was a total, emphatic, enthusiastic support of these major moves, including the lakefront and the Whakarewa Forest, by the Chamber President in his speech, and also talking with all the members. And in fact, 
One gentleman who owns a motel came up to me after the chairman's speech and said he, he signed the petition under the wrong pretenses. I've had two other ladies who were believed that the language used and the, uh, the hysteria used that we were going ahead with the lakefront at Whakariwiri at the cost of the museum and the sale of the Morrison Performing Arts Centre was also false. And she uh, wanted me... Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't know why we're wasting our time on uh, discussing um, when there's no one over here to actually argue against whether that is the truth or not, um, because the people that did the petition are not over here to justify the cause of what they're being accused about, uh, as, as, and it could be all just hearsay. So I, I don't really think that's fair. Yeah, Madam Chair, I just want to I just want to say that um, uh, I'm I'm reporting back what I have heard. It may be hearsay, but it isn't because it's we had the facts given to us at the chamber meeting. I rest my case. It's going to go through anyway. Let's move on. Right, and Councillor Maxwell is the mover of the motion. Do you wish to say any more? The things regarding the petition because uh, you know it's quite alarming that we we should have international visitors signing it and 71 people from other parts in New Zealand I thought that would have been ruled out straight away but I want to highlight uh, just touch on and, and Councillor Sturt did touch on the um, our BA5 last week which I thought was well received here um, the final uh, Chamber of Commerce presentation but the one that also stood out was in September when uh, Under Secretary Fletcher Tabito presented down at the Energy Event Centre, and and the the people that I was talking to during during lunch, uh, people who were really some were sort of waiting to hear what was going to be presented and um, talking to them later, uh, they were really. Um, uh, really pleased about the way we were moving forward with the, the projects. So, um, yeah, um, I'll leave the other one for when we go into confidential, but more than happy to move the motion. Thank you. Uh, that's the end of the process. I put the motion now. We've had the questions, and the mover has had his right of reply. So all those in favour, that um, item two, that Council support advancement of Rotorua Lakefront development in Whakariwiri River Forest projects by way of signalling intent to approve the contracts with the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment. Order, uh, Madam Chair, just before you uh, yep. call a vote on that, something has just occurred to me. The way that's worded at the moment, you're signalling a future decision? The intent. To make a future decision, which isn't quite right. <laughs> you, you, you can, you can signal that we're going to dis discuss it discuss. and decide, but you cannot signal that we're going to approve it, to because discuss. we don't know till we get to there. Yeah. Yeah. So you're moving an amendment to remove signalling intent to approve, but we are signalling advancement. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, right, we'll move the motion. All those in favour as amended, please say aye. Aye. Contrary? Yeah. No. no. Division called for? You want your names for Show of hands, please. All those in favour, please say aye. All those in favour, please say aye. Contrary, and you wish your names recorded against. Okay. Okay. Hmm? Uh, Councillor Gould and Councillor Bentley. <coughs> Thank you. Move that you go into confidential, and we'll have a five-minute break. Thank you. Thing to do. Yeah. Oh, stop. We can't, we're not going into confidential just yet. Sorry, it's on the order paper. 
So, very sorry. Um, Una is just presenting to us at the year end, connecting our vision to action, and then we go into confidential. Una. Thank you, JP. You can, I think we're going to have a break after this, so yeah. I, this will only take probably maybe five to ten minutes tops. Carry on. Um, so, members, you'll remember a couple of months ago now um, I showed a very simple PowerPoint presentation which reflected on um, the things that had been achieved in the past financial year. Since that time, um, and with the help of the comms team, we've taken that concept and developed it um, much further. Um, and that presentation was presented at the Business After Five on Tuesday, um, the 4th of December. That um, clip and presentation <laughs> extends that reflection of what we've achieved in one year to actually look at the progress and achievements um, starting back in 2013 uh, through till now. So we thought we'd like to take the opportunity for those um, that weren't able to attend the business after five um, just to reflect upon that clip. So I'm just going to ask Carol to um, bring that wee video up. The video, please, Carol. Yes, it's also on YouTube and you can view it through our council website as well.
Uh, we have also acted upon and heard from yourselves and from uh, many members in the community that our current website is difficult to navigate and it's hard to find information about our current projects listed in our LTP. So we've developed in-house a location where we can bring together all of those projects um, and people can go straight to the site um, and be able to find out information around our projects. So landing on Council's um, web page, uh, there are two ways that you can get to this page that we've just landed on here. There's the key projects um, bar right at the very top of the website, you can click into that or on the actual website page itself there is a spotlight uh, around this vision to action. L what um, further work is still to happen um, on this page here, we have under development at the moment an introductory video that is going to link the vision um, with projects and we hope to have that up here on the site um, by the end of the year as well. But this is an area where if you click on um, the project timeline, members of the community will be able to go into a calendar and you'll be able to see events based around some of those major projects and when milestones and events are proposed to happen. If you want to find out more information on those projects, I'll just pause, I think I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Carol, if you'd like to click on December, and you would scroll through here and people would be able to, at a very high level, um, get a glimpse of what's proposed to happen in those areas. Uh, we'll just, we'll just, yeah. So you can go into, And Carol, if you go back to, um, just take us straight back to the projects, our projects. And if you want more information on the detail of the projects, you can click on any one of those tiles and it will give you information uh, on the background, um, the timeline, where the funding from those projects is coming from, and some frequently asked questions. So we thought it might be a good opportunity to maybe click into the museum project and just give you an idea of what's covered off in there. And this is all part of our ongoing ways of looking at how we can engage and how we can tell those stories on connecting the vision um, with, with progress and with action. Going forward from here, um, the, I guess the, the key is to ensuring that this information is kept up to date and is relevant. And the comms team and along with project managers um, will be ensuring that this information as new events and new updates happen, new announcements are made, that information will flow through and will be up on these project areas as well. Going forward into the new year, we're also looking at developing um, some more graphic sort of flyovers, 3D models of each of the projects so that touching people's hearts and minds, they can actually be able to get a better understanding and appreciation of what we might see um, when the projects are completed. So what's the lakefront going to look like when it's completed? What's the forest improvements going to look like? And people will be able to, by way of almost virtual tours, be able to, to walk through those projects. So that was just a, a little bit of an update really, just to show you um, how we are looking at um, one area in particular around our sort of our website area at the moment of how we're trying to, to work on new ways of showing that connection of vision to action. Thank you. Thank you, Una, and uh, I, I think it's quite remarkable when you watch that flyover really, um, you ought to be congratulated. What? What incredible amount of work has gone on, and Jeff, the team too. It's a great way to end the year, really publicly, um, to see the level of activity that you've all been part of. Um, so thank you for that, Councillor Maxwell. Una, wonderful. Um, can I ask the? Remember that during the year, one of our committee meetings, either Mayor Pickers or Charles, we had a presentation from. 
the group who was working on the that beautiful filtering thing that was going to happen from the forestry down to the lake with a, with the that videos on here. I'm not 100% sure whether it is, um, but I'll make sure because it should be. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Are there any other questions? No, well, thank you. There's no decision to be made, but I, 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 I'm pleased you brought it here because many of you haven't seen it, and it shows the level of activity. <coughs> Actually, if you walk through the centre that I do every night before I go home, there's walkthroughs <coughs> with every one of these projects and just huge detail and timelines and where the project's going. So for our public, and for those of you watching, to be able to see this online, I think that's going to help tell our story about how the vision is unfolding. So on that note, um, we've had a motion to go into confidential. No, we haven't. Have Thank you. Yeah. Seconded yeah. Councillor Donaldson. All those in favour, please say aye. And I'll just point out that the items that we're discussing in confidential Adoption of the minutes, the museum update presentation, and the Rotorua Lakefront MB grant contract, and the Whakariwariwa Forest grant, and confidential. We've noted that. We bring them forward. Thank you. Thank you, and Merry Christmas to you all, the public. And uh, I hope you have a nice time with friends or family.